they've been to uh, <laughs> immediately talk about whatever I'm studying. You know, if you read the scripture, you'll find that that'll be what's on your mind. And that wherever it is that you're studying in the scripture, it'll just be a place that you're learning and you want to share with others. And I um, sometimes wonder, man, how do people always have something to share spiritually? I just love it when somebody has stopped and say, Pastor, you know, I learned this today. God showed me this week. Many times I'll just ask somebody, what did God share with you today? And you study the scripture and you'll find it'll be the focus and the things that are on your mind. We're in Romans chapter 7, and this is a passage of scripture that is vital to a believer understanding how to have spiritual victory. Now we've seen in the book of Romans several uh, really sections, and we're moving into a different section here, beginning our movement into that today. So here's what we'll do. We'll read our text. We're going to read verses 1 through 7. That's all we'll have time for this morning. Uh, Romans chapter 7, verses 1 through 7. And then we'll do just a, as short a review as is possible and get into the Scripture. Now, here is a question that begs an answer. And this would be an answer that individuals, when we say, know ye not, the answer would be, yes, I know. Okay, here, chapter 7 and verse 1, the Scripture would say, it says, Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law. Okay, now, who is being addressed specifically in the parentheses in Romans chapter 1 and verse 1? Jews. Okay, there's two categories that have been addressed in, in Romans so far, right? Okay, so... We have, we're speaking to a category. In other words, if people are saying, well, I don't know the law, who are they going to go and ask? The Jews. Okay. Now, is he excluding those individuals that don't know the law? No. But this illustration doesn't work for somebody that wouldn't understand it. Okay, let's read. For I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she's loosed from the law of her husband. So then if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she's free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sins, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead, wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit, and not in the oldness of the letter. What shall we say then? Is the law of sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law... For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, help us this morning to understand the difference between serving in newness of spirit and being dead in the oldness of letter. And God, I ask that you would help us today to comprehend the path, the way, the method for spiritual victory. And God, may it be so that we would not use liberty for an occasion of the flesh. But God, may it be so as well, that we would not be so arrogant as to assume that that which is spiritual is something we can attain to. Lord, show us this truth today. Help us with it. We pray in Christ's name for His sake. Amen. Okay, we begin the study in the book of Romans as an address of who could be saved. Romans chapter 1, Romans chapter 2 talks about who can be saved and who needs to be saved would probably be a better way of putting it. Romans chapter 1 says that the gospel is the power of God to salvation to everyone. Everyone who? Everyone that believeth. And so there is a difference between individuals who are going to heaven and individuals who are not. And the difference is simply what they do with Jesus Christ. Now, there's the argument, well, not everybody knows about Jesus. What about people that have never heard of Christianity, never heard of religion? Romans 1, Romans 2 deals with that. It shows that just by nature itself, they can see that there is a God, and not only that there's a God, but He is not just a little God. They can see the Godhead, and the Bible says, because of that, they're without excuse. Now, 
those individuals that do not believe, the Bible calls them, or refers to them this way, they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. And so we see, everyone needs to believe in Jesus. Everyone can have the power of God for salvation because of Christ. And the difference between those who are saved and those who are not is the simple matter of what you do with Jesus Christ. Now, friend, don't try to split hairs in the doctrine of salvation. The Bible teaches all kind of things that are ramifications of our salvation. But I want to state it as simply as I possibly can. The difference between someone who goes to heaven and somebody who is damned forever in hell is belief. And it's believing in Jesus or not believing in Jesus. You say, Pastor, you didn't talk about repentance. My friend, repentance is about Jesus. See, every person in their heart knows that Jesus is God. You say, Pastor, they don't know that. They don't know Jesus. The Bible says even the Godhead, so they're without excuse. And every person knows in their heart that they are a sinner. And the Bible says that what they do with Jesus is the matter of what they repent about. You study repentance in the book of Acts, you study in the book of Romans, you'll find repentance, hey, it's, it's from what I am dead in my trespasses and sins to being alive unto Christ. And my friend, it's all about Jesus. Listen, you can't be saved and not believe in Jesus. There's no way. Jesus is the object of our salvation. God won't forgive sins of a repentant person, my friend. I'll say that again. God will not re forgive a repentant person of his sins. You can be repentant about your sin all you want to, but God will forgive your sin because Christ died for them and He became sin for you. And because when Christ was buried in the grave, the sins were buried with Him. And when He was raised from the dead, He was raised into a, in, in, the, in the way that we can identify with Him in life. And our sins are buried with Jesus. But my friend, God will never forgive you. Say, I've heard people say, well, well, I want to deal with God about my sin myself. I'm sorry for my sin, and I just want to confess it to God, and I don't need Jesus. My friend, God will forgive you because Christ became sin for you. The object of your repentance, though, my friend, is turning from your sin to Jesus Christ. Does everybody understand that? I don't want to split hairs, but uh, the all kind of people get off into all kind of strange teaching about salvation, and everybody says that everybody else is wrong, and I'm just telling you, you understand salvation is believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. It's plain and simple and it's in the Scripture. That'll help you. Read a gospel tract and throw out the ones that try to get off on a tangent. And I don't mean to be unkind about them, but, and, and by the way, somebody that teaches repentance of sin and, and that you need to ask God to save you, they're teaching the same thing, but, but they'll tell you they're not. And so, um, just, just, anyway, I didn't even mean to get off on that today. Well, everyone can be saved according to Romans chapter 1 and Romans chapter 2. Then we saw all the way up to chapter 5 this whole matter of what we are. What, what we are in Christ Jesus and who uh, can have grace. And there are a couple of problems with grace. What, not, not problems with God's grace, but problems with a misunderstanding of grace according to chapter 5. Who is a recipient of the grace of God and how much can God's grace accomplish? We saw the illustration that where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. Where it's Christ's righteousness, the ability of Jesus to forgive for His righteous blood to cover sin, the ability of God to justify you based upon the righteousness of Jesus Christ is unlimited. The wrong response to grace then would be that we would say, well, because grace is unlimited, then... Uh, what does it matter if I sin? What does it matter if I... I couldn't keep the law anyway, and Christ's righteousness is sufficient, and so why not just go out and do whatever I'm going to do, and then God will give grace for it, and it'll be fine because every time that Christ's righteousness covers sin, every time Christ's righteousness eradicates sin, it brings glory to God. Does it bring glory to God when a sinner repents? Sure does. So here's the idea then, the twisted, warped conclusion, and we dealt with this last week, and so we won't this morning. The warped, twisted conclusion is, the more I sin, the better God looks, and so He'll be glad, I'll be able to do what I want to do, and so I can be saved, and I can sin all I want to, and it'll just make God look good. And so, it's just a win-win situation. My friend, being a slave to sin is never a winning situation. And if you'll remember what it was before you were saved, what it was like, 
to be lost and dead in the trespasses of sin.